Good afternoon. When I was young, in my teens and into my 30s, maybe my 40s, Joseph was my Bible hero. I loved how he faced incredible adversity that was unfair and unjust and always leaned into God for a vision of his future. I loved how honest Joseph was and how clearly he saw sin that was crouching at his door and how he reframed his brother's hatred of him as God's plan to save many lives. And then there's a detail that I find really remarkable about Joseph is that the Egyptians would not eat any meal with a Hebrew. So Joseph ate every meal by himself during the time he was there all alone. But now in my 70s, I'm learning from Moses and how to live my remaining years. Moses was 80 when he had a conversation with God in the form of a burning bush. We find that conversation in Exodus chapters 3 and 4. I love that God chose a man that no one else would have, and that the man he chose had already failed at rescuing his people, at least on his own effort some 40 years earlier. I love the dialogue between Moses and God, and how many excuses Moses came up with, and how persistent and patient God was with him. The Lord came to Moses with a task and wasn't leaving till he had received a commitment from him to obey the Lord. And I love that God gave the job to an 80-year-old shepherd, someone completely ill-equipped for the job. Moses had no experience, no confidence, no clue what to do. The only thing Moses could visualize for himself was failure. So he said, I just don't want to do it. The dialogue begins in chapter 11, verse, chapter 3, verse 11. But first, God tells Moses that he has come down to rescue his people. The fact is, rescuing was never the job of Moses. Trusting and obeying God was his job. Moses gives five excuses that all have a variation on the same theme. That theme being, I don't want to do it. In verse 11, Moses said to, to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? In other words, I'm a nobody. I have nothing to offer. Excuse number two was that Moses didn't know God's proper name when in introducing himself to the people which is really lame. But it's really another way of saying, no one's going to believe I had a conversation with you. The third excuse, just like the first two, was that no one would listen to him. His fourth rationale for turning down God was that he was a poor speaker. He gets tongue-tied. In other words, don't depend on me. I'll only mess things up. One of the reasons I love Joseph so much is that I'm just like him. You may not ever hear my excuses, but God does. And just like Moses, God is, and just like with Moses, God is not one to take no for an answer. He just waits me out until I agree with him. And then I follow wherever he's leading me. God's answers to Moses' excuses we're also on a variation of it on a theme, which is, I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. It's the same answer he is still giving his church today. So now, in my elder years, Moses is seeped into the spotlight for me. As you get older, your world naturally grows smaller. You have less influence than you did when you were younger. You're not as physically strong. Your body hurts more. And you have less stamina than you did when you were younger. And maybe, maybe, you start thinking like Moses. My time has passed. 
Or maybe you're younger and you think you have nothing to offer or think no one will listen to you. That was the excuse Jeremiah gave God. Moses should give everyone hope that you can't be too old to be useful to God. And Jeremiah gives everyone young the same hope. You don't need any confidence or experience to be useful for God. You don't even need to know what to do next. God does. And Moses teaches that God doesn't listen to our excuses, no matter how whiny they may be. Your friends might. Your parents might. But God will just wait you out until you decide to listen to him. At every age, whether young or old, God presents us with opportunities to work in his kingdom. Hebrews 13, um, 21 is a prayer by the author. It says this, May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The author is praying that God who equips people for doing good, would do a work in us that would be pleasing to him. That's exactly what he was doing with Moses, even as Moses was fighting against him, equipping him for doing the work. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God does the work in us so that we can work for others. What is pleasing to God. Another passage from Philippians 2.13. It's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good pleasure. All these passages are saying similar things that God has a work for us to do in his kingdom and will equip us to accomplish them. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they may say your, see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. These works referred to in these passages are God's work to repair a fallen world, works of redemption and reconciliation. So whatever God, whatever good work God has called you into, whether that's as a neighbor or a caregiver, in a classroom or a hospital, to the poor in this country or another, or to the orphaned, the unborn, the widow, or thousands of young women who are enslaved around the world. You will be ill-equipped to do this job on your own, but you can lean into God for it's his job to rescue. It is our job to listen, to believe, and obey. I hope we have a good day and I hope we have a good week.